This is a special bonus edition of Judaism Unbound, Dan and Lex, guest on Bad Jew Weekly. Well, so uh, Lex, we're here just giving a little bit of a brief intro to this episode of a new podcast called Bad Jew Weekly that you and I were honored to uh, be considered bad Jews to be on. You know we're bad, we're bad, we're really, really... Sorry. I love a shalom. You know, I mean, in addition to a fun uh, interview that we're excited to share, I'm really excited about Bad Jew Weekly for another reason, which is that it's the kind of thing that we're really encouraging regular Jews to start doing. You know, Jenna, who's the host of the show, is uh, continually saying how she's not an expert, et cetera, et cetera. And it's exactly the kind of knowledge versus chutzpah curve stuff that we've been talking about. And we're not only excited to be guests on the show, but also excited to support this uh, effort. But And we hope there are going to be so many more like it. Yeah, I agree. And I, just in general, I really like when there are new podcasts, new Jewish podcasts rolling around. I mean, I, I feel like hopefully this is clear to folks listening, but we we definitely don't see ourselves as like fighting for listeners. I think that it's really awesome when we continue to grow the Jew, grow the Jewish podcast landscape. I swear it's like doubling in size every year at this point. Um and Bad Jew Weekly is certainly a good one. There's some other new ones that I've been tooling around with and listening to. So I, I like seeing more folks out there talking about interesting Jewish stuff. It's good for all of us. Yeah, so here we go. Shalom, y'all. I'm Jenna Reback, and this is Bad Jew Weekly. <laughs> So this week, I'm doing something a little different. I am combining What Jew Talking About with Brews with Jews. I am joined today virtually by the men of Judaism Unbound, a Judaism podcast hosted by people who actually know what they're talking about. So I am here today with Dan Liebenson and Lex Rofus. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I can tell you how fun it is to be a guest on a podcast. Yay! Dan, let's talk a little about you first. Dan is the founder and president of the Institute for the Next Jewish Future, in addition to being the co-host of Judaism Unbound. And you have an amazing, very rich experience working in different capacities for the Jewish community. You obviously started as a law professor. That was a big change for you. You went on to work for Hillel. You were named Chicago Jewish News' Jewish Chicago of the Year in 2010. You beat all the other Jews <laughs> in Chicago for that. So that, that's amazing. So what prompted you to make that switch from law to professional Judaism, as we call it? Yeah, it's not something that I ever intended to do. My dad was a conservative rabbi growing up, and I wanted to be anything but. And... Um, uh, you know, so uh, I, I always think of Michael Corleone in The Godfather, where he says, you know, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of the story. <laughs> I was actually teaching at a Catholic law school, and it was uh, struggling over the meaning of what it meant to be a Catholic law school. And there was a real struggle f about that. And I was really into the struggle. I really found it interesting. And I ended up feeling like it was going to ultimately go my way, but it was going to be 20 years Till it got there. And that was kind of the first time in my life that I started to think about, you know, a project for the next 20 years of my life or 30 years of my life or my entire professional life. And it was only when I kind of thought that way, as opposed to, you know, what am I going to do next year, that I was able to imagine going back and working in the Jewish world. Because for me, it, it's always been a story of dissatisfaction with Judaism. And it just always felt like something that couldn't be repaired in any short period of time and so that it just wouldn't be for me. And it was only when I started to be able to think long term that I said, oh, yeah, I guess I, if I'm going to do anything long term, I might as well work on this project of reimagining Judaism long term because that actually does mean a lot to me. It would be really meaningful if it were successful. Uh, and I, I might as well do that as opposed to try to figure out what a Catholic law school would mean, which wasn't really um, personally important. I think, and I imagine too, that the skills you had as a law professor are actually very part and parcel with looking at Judaism critically, the way that the Torah actually commands us to. 
Yeah, I think that's true, as well as the ideas that I kind of developed from law school and from being a law professor about the way in which complex systems like a legal system change over time and how they tend to drift in a conservative direction. And if they're healthy, then periodically, I think in the American constitutional system, it's like every 50 years, there's this kind of rebooting of it, you know, t tends to go in a liberal direction. And then it sort of drifts again, naturally in a sort of conservative direction. And, and I feel like that sort of deep immersion in that process, in contrast to Judaism, which I think struggles to go back in that rebooting process, you know, it's been really important in my thinking. And the other part of my biography that I don't really talk about that much because it seems so bizarre is that um, I actually went to medical school for two years before I went to law school. And, that is not um, on your bio. Yeah, but, that is not on your it's bio. Not because it's, it, it's not because it's generally too hard to explain. So it's kind of a scoop for Bad Jew Weekly. And, <laughs> um, the, the, but, but I think it's really important, you know, because, um, um, for me, you know, when, when I do tell people that I went to med school at an earlier point, they say, oh, so you didn't like med school and you left. And I said and I always say, no, I, I actually loved medical school. It's probably the best thing that I've ever done educationally. I just realized that I didn't want to be a doctor. You know, when we started going into the hospital, I realized, like, I don't like taking care of sick people. So that was when I went to law school and I thought I was going to do a joint JDMD and I would do kind of health policy. But in terms of the Jewish connection, what for me was so important in that experience is that I really learned how to think like a scientist. And I think I think about Judaism like a scientist in a way that very few people do. Um, and I'm really interested in experimentation, in theories, in, um, in all sorts of, of, of ways of thinking that I think I actually got out of my science background even more so than from my law background. What does the next Jewish future mean, and what would you like that to look like? It's such a funny story. So I'll, I'll tell you another uh, Bad Jew Weekly scoop. The name, the Institute for the Next Jewish Future, sort of came about as a, at a last minute, sort of um, having to file the nonprofit 501c3 papers situation, where um, we started the Institute years ago when I got an award that was kind of some unrestricted funds uh, to accelerate my work. And at that time, I wasn't ready to really jump into a, a new project. And, and so we set up a, a corporation that was really not going to really get going for a number of years. So we weren't really all that focused on what was its name going to be. But you had to file the papers. And we knew it was going to be about the Jewish future. So and Yeshiva University already had a center for the Jewish future. So we thought we'll be the Institute for the Jewish future. <laughs> and then one of our board members at the last minute said, how about the next Jewish future? And that sounded cool to me. I've always been a Steve Jobs fan. And he had a company called Next. And so there was some <laughs> element of, 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 um, you know, it wasn't all that well thought out, but I think that our board member at that time was saying, you know, what we want to do is think two steps ahead, not just one step ahead. So it's not only that we're talking about the Jewish future, but we're talking about the Jewish future after the Jewish future. Amazing. Fantastic. So Lex, let's talk about you a little bit. So you had a two-year education fellowship that's really caught my attention because it was at the Goldring Woldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life based in Nailed Jackson, it. Mississippi. That's right. Well, I come from very good Southern Jewish stock straight out of Knoxville. So Yeah, I remember hearing that on some of your episodes. I was excited about that. What was your experience of Southern Jewish life? I had a great experience in the South. What I was able to experience was traveling around to just a lot of different congregations. And so I was working with some um, some reform congregations, some conservative congregations, one renewal congregation, some unaffiliated congregations all over the region, um, sort of on the west end from Texas all the way to the, on the northeast end to Virginia. And um, basically it threw all of my expectations about what Judaism does and doesn't look like up in the air because I saw a lot of communities. I mean, I saw communities that were majority interfaith families or almost exclusively interfaith families for the first time. I, I saw communities where their expectation was the fact that they had 70 or 80 families in their synagogue was actually like a big synagogue compared to the ones that were closest, which were 50 miles away or 75 miles away. Um, I lived for two years in Jackson, Mississippi, which um, has one synagogue, which means that even though it's a reform synagogue, it in many ways has to sort of straddle a lot of different directions. Um, and it was it was really interesting and worthwhile for me to, to see all of that. And then there's also just – 
what you gain by living in a different region for a few years. And I spend a lot of time in grocery stores and elsewhere, just like randomly talking to people. Cause that's a thing that you can do. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, you know, a different environment. Now I, I would acknowledge that politically I'm incredibly far from the way Mississippi tends to vote. Um, and that when you, when you get out of the immediate Jackson area in a lot of directions, you start to get into territory that, um, would be in many ways less comfortable for somebody who wears a yarmulke all the time like I do. Um, but I, even in, even when I would spend time in some of those areas, generally found people more curious about my Jewishness and Judaism than antagonistic. Speaking of your Judaism, you're currently a rabbinic student through Aleph, the Alliance for Jewish Renewal. Yeah. My listeners and I have talked a lot about, you know, reform, conservative, orthodox as the kind of three most mainstream denominations of Judaism. What is renewal Judaism? And yes. what made you what made you choose to be ordained through that movement? The million dollar question or million dollar and six hundred thirteen dollar question. I was in college and it was my junior year and we actually had we had like a learning Shabbat where people could just like give a fifteen minute spiel about stuff and open up a conversation. I was going to like give a spiel about the, the movements of American Judaism. But as I was Googling and as I was looking around, I stumbled into this thing called Jewish Renewal. And mostly it was weird to me. Like mostly I was interested in it because it was very strange. And what it was and what it is, is what I try to encapsulate and which one of our guests that we just interviewed tried to encapsulate as a, a hybrid between Reconstructionist Judaism, which for those who aren't familiar, is like uh, it was it came about in the mid 20th century by a man named Mordecai Kaplan and is generally seen as sort of the most progressive politically of the Jewish movements and is centered on the idea of Judaism as a civilization. That's sort of its founding tenet. It's a cross between that and like Hasidism, which is very hard for people to to map. Um, but the reason why that is, is because the founder, this guy named Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, grew up in the Hasidic world. He was part of Chabad and actually left mid midway through his life. And he still felt a, a strong connection to many tenets of Hasidism, including sort of the deep spirituality, the individual emotional connection to the divine. And the result was as he as he sought to retain those elements of what he loved about Judaism, he he realized he no longer could hold fast to many of the conservative realities of how Chabad sees the world. And so he basically at first it wasn't even a movement. He just had people that followed him a little bit um, and he created this hybrid of sort of a progressive uh, like a, a feminist progressive pseudo radical like he would call it neo hasidic thing i'd love to transition now to the kind of what jew talking about topic of today and this is something that i have just not felt confident to address on the podcast thus far because i find it incredibly difficult which is the hof torah so for my regular listeners i talk a lot about the tanakh which is the torah the Nevi'im and the Kituvim, the kind of three big categories of Jewish texts that we have smashed together in a big book. Uh, we talk a lot about the Torah, obviously. We do the Torah portion every week. The Kituvim are amazing writings that um, kind of an anthology of amazing Jewish thought that I've touched on too, but I really haven't done the Nevi'im, the prophets, that much. Um, and that's because I find them incredibly difficult. I really don't find them immediately accessible the way I find so much other Jewish sacred text very, very interesting and engaging. Like right now, how we're in the book of Ayikra, we're in the book of Leviticus, and even though there are things in there that I think are incredibly difficult and challenging in a modern context, I feel invited to engage with those texts because they're addressed to me. Whereas a lot of the writings of the Nevi'im, you know, these are these are prophets, right, from 
from my favorite time period, the days of yore. So there's a lot about militaristic conquest, and there's a lot about, you know, God will bless you and you will vanquish your enemies. And on the other hand, God will smite you and your enemies will vanquish you. And it's really, really hard for me to wrap my head around. Just for some brief context, half Torah does not mean half Torah, which I thought for many years that it did. Yeah, me too. It's... I, I always thought it was half Torah back in the day. Right. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that was like a less important than the Torah. So it was the half Torah. <laughs> exactly. It's from the root word for the Hebrew of to conclude, as in to conclude the week's reading. So in a regular Shabbat service, we read the Torah portion uh, from this big scroll and you it's very ceremonial. You carry the scroll around, you read it, it's a whole you bless every section of it as you read it. And then after that we read the Haf Torah which we actually read from a book. And the Hoff Torah is interesting. It has its own blessings, and it actually has its own tropes. It has its own musical notation that is actually different from what we read for the Torah. Now, I'd love for you guys to chime in on this. I couldn't find one really conclusive explanation or understanding. It seems like there's a lot of debate about when the Hof Torah came to be read as part of the Shabbat service. Um, it sounds like it was common practice by 100 CE, but there's a lot of debate about whether it was to differentiate Jews from Samaritans, um, you know, when these things came to be um, came to be incorporated in our tradition and you know, whether they were brought in kind of deliberately or whether originally they was kind of like, well, you know, there's a Torah portion, pick your Hof Torah, whatever you want to put in. Um, nowadays, it's all codified based on the Talmud. And so Hof Torah, the, the Hof Torah reading of the week is either correlated thematically to the Torah portion of the week, or it is, um, it has to do with a holiday that falls within that week as a kind of reminder for, um, you know, a kind of a deeper exploration of the holiday that we're celebrating. So I'd love to just kind of start by talking generally about these readings from Nebuchadnezzar. So also the the Hof Torah is always kind of a, it's not all of Nebuchadnezzar that we read. It's kind of little segments that are matched up to each Torah portion, just as one more kind of thing to add in. But I have a really hard time with these. I mean, do you guys in like, do you guys enjoy these readings? I find them very, very difficult. So, so a couple of things. Like, first of all, I'll just say, um, you know, one of the one of the big themes that's come up on our show is that, um, first of all, a lot of Jewish practices, like nobody really knows why they happen, and, and some of them get better folk explanations than others. So, some of them, uh, a lot of people say they know why they happened, and they'll just very quickly give you this this certain folk explanation because it sort of makes sense. And then there are other things like, why do we have a Haftarah that there's also all kinds of folk explanations for, but they don't make much sense. And so, um, you know, the bottom line is that nobody knows. And but that's not only true of the Haftarah, that's true of like, you know, probably like 98 percent of Judaism. And and that's where one of the, you know, and, and another another piece that that I think, you know, we've really sort of developed over time that we think is very important for, you know, bad Jews to, to understand is that. Um, is that if you think about Jews today, b because of our just general high quality of, of education, of general education and our access to the Internet, that, that I think that most regular Jews in the 21st century in America are in a better position than 99% of rabbis throughout Jewish history to be able to answer any Jewish question. Uh, and that, you know, we can talk about what, what, the value add of being a rabbi is in that situation. I think there is one, but I mean, I love the way that you just introduced this because, you know, basically you, you just gave the, the best explanation that anybody has ever given about the Haftorah because the bottom line is nobody has a good explanation. Um, but, but I think that um, one, one thing that I would say though about the prophets as opposed to the Haftorah is that I actually, um, having done a deep dive into kind of critical scholarship about the Bible, I've come through that study to, to care a lot about the the books that we call the prophets, which which actually have two different kinds of books in them. What, some are histories, and some are um, sort of poetic books of prophecy, visions, you know, et cetera. And it's actually interesting because the histories, um, 
are not often read as Haftorahs for Shabbat because they're because what the Haftorah is trying to do on Shabbat is, like you said, thematically mirror the um, the Torah portion, and generally that's going to work better with some kind of oracle than it is with some kind of history. So I think a lot of people aren't reading the parts of the prophets that are actually really interesting and engaging, which are these amazing historical stories. And the other piece that I've sort of pulled out of the, the deep dive into critical biblical studies is that actually in terms of the order in which things were written, or at least the order in which things happened, to, it depends how you think about it. But in some ways, actually, the prophets happen first. You know, that the, the books of the prophets are this um, more or less contemporarily written history of a certain time period in in the history of the Jews. And then the Torah was actually sort of put together later out of materials that were developed during that time, but but to suit a, a very different time and a very different agenda during the Babylonian exile, which which takes place after the time described in the books of the prophets. So, so I think it's a really fascinating story once you sort of understand that by reading the prophets, we're actually reading the real prehistory of Judaism. And then then that opens up all kinds of interesting questions. Yeah, the first thing I want to say is that no, absolutely not. You are not the only person that has has a hard time with the prophets. Like there are many such people. I am one such people. Um, very common. And but I but I also so I and I want to say I think that a large reason for that is exactly what Dan just said, which is that when we when we have these half Torah portions, a they're like short snippets. So you, you can't, like in addition to what Dan said about how as an oracle, like that's easier to match thematically, you also just like can't have an ongoing narrative in like a chapter or two. But I also really, really agree that there are some gems in Prophets and they're mostly from the books that we don't highlight in the Haftarot. So the the books that are the biggest features of the Haftarot are like the big three, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And occasionally you get excerpts from these other books that when they're, when there's a super easy connection, I, I think in the 12 spies, there's a, in, in the book of numbers, there's a very, very similar kind of tale in the book of Joshua that they, that they put to connect with it. I think there's a few situations where some of the later minor prophets come in, but, um, I actually, for the first time, just a couple of years ago, read a bunch of the latter prophets for a class I was taking. Um, I fell in love with the book of Amos. I think it's an incredible book for anybody who is progressive in today's world. This is where, like, because people talk about, like, the prophetic tradition, right? They talk about how the prophets call for justice and all this. And then you read a lot of it and you're like, where? Like, uh, help me, because it's it's not easy to find. But, and I will say, Isaiah does have some of this, like Isaiah of the big three tends to have the most of that. But Amos is only like eight chapters, I think. And it's it's just really calling out why, you know what, we're not so much, like, we're not better than everybody else. We're actually doing terrible things also. And we need to be doing a better job of looking out for the widows, the sick, the orphans. We, we need to be stepping up our game in all of these ways. I think it's an incredible book. I think the book of Judges is a fascinating, really interesting look at at human nature. I mean, it's it's there's this scholars have written about like the cycle of the book of the book of judges. It's typically somebody comes to power as a judge. There's I mean, there's there's like a rise and fall factor that keeps on happening over and over. And there's some really interesting narratives in there. The story of Samson and Delilah that people might be familiar with is from the book of judges. There's there's Deborah who is a female judge like 3,000 years ago. And we actually know from scholarship that the Song of Deborah, along with the Song of the Sea in Exodus, are the two oldest texts of the Torah. So we have like not just 2,500, but like 3,000-year-old precedent for like the idea at least that there would be a female warrior um, in the Jewish tradition. That's cool. That's not erasing all of the terrible patriarchy we have elsewhere, but it's cool. Um, so I, like there are, there are these spots that I think are really spectacular, but, um, because the rabbis, when sort of making the juxtapositions between Torah portions and Haftorah chose a lot more of the praise parts that are just talking about God being great and all this, um, it's often not what we find. I will just 
sorry, I've, I've rambled, but I will lastly say uh, the the rule of the Haftorah, it's actually like a, a rabbinic rule, is that it has to end on a positive note. So if you've got a chunk that's pretty negative, um, they'll often like grab two random verses from somewhere somewhere else and put it at the end. And often the stuff at the very end is is pretty cool because um, they because they are choosing from wherever and they find the great the, the best stuff in in the one from this week that we're about I think about to look into um, it ends with it ends with a famous line that actually makes its way into the daily Amida prayer um, about like God's healing um, so it's just like it's it's interesting to look at how the Haftarah flows and often the end if if you want to skip the first two thirds because it feels boring to you, don't feel bad about it. I don't, um, and you can find some gems at the end. One more thing I'm going to say um, as we dive in, uh, Lex, I think it was alluded to, or was it was it Dan or Lex? Yeah. One of you alluded to the, the prophets calling for justice, and that can be hard to find if you are just looking at the Hof Torah chunk that we're reading as opposed to the whole whole larger segment of the Nevi'im. Um, Rabbi Avram Joshua Heschel said something that really resonated with me um, to the effect of, to the prophets, even the smallest moral failing is a catastrophe, right? This idea of holding us all to a higher standard and, um, you know, forcing us to confront the consequences of our actions. With this week's Haftorah portion, it's actually very confusing. And it, like, if you're not really deeply immersed in the cycle of the year and the patterns of these things, it's hard to know even which Haftorah is is up. Because this week, and this is not an infrequent occurrence, this week is a double portion for the Torah. It's Bahar um, and Bahukotai, which are the last two portions of Leviticus, but they're really one portion this year. And um, two out of three years, they're, they're only one portion. Uh, approximately but um so in many congregations you'll be like folks will be reading the second one the chukotai <laughs> is the the half torah for it is from jeremiah um who as you may know is a bullfrog but is also <laughs> a a member of the elite trinity of big prophets jeremiah ezekiel and isaiah and um so we're in chap- chapter 16, verse 19, through chapter 17, verse 14. And, um, I mean, I just spoke about this. For me, I, I skim through and immediately latch on the very end, which is this piece. Um, and I'll quick read the Hebrew. Um, it's very short. The last verse is, Rifaini Adonai ve'erafeh, hoshi'eni ve'ivashea ki tehilati ata. So that may sound familiar to some folks. It may not sound familiar to many others. Um, it comes from well, it, it comes from here, but it has been moved from here into the weekday Amidah. So of all the texts everywhere, the rabbis who put together our our daily prayer of eighteen now nineteen blessings chose this statement. Um, and it's it's sort of the closest thing we have to a daily healing prayer. The people may know the Misha Beirach prayer, which is used for healing. Um, that's generally only associated with the Torah service, so it's only on Saturday mornings and then Mondays and Thursdays. This one is every day, and it's a chance to to reflect on healing. So I do think that there's a really important thing happening here that we get that um, that quotation from this excerpt. Um, and I want to also note that in the original. It's singular. It's heal me. So Jeremiah is talking, heal me, Adonai, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. And I think that's a great sentiment, and I think people can absolutely think of this prayer in the singular. But that won't sound as familiar to some people, because in the daily one, it was switched. They made it plural. They made um, most things in our in, in the Amidah prayer are about we collective, because it's really not the the idea at least is that this is this is a collective kind of healing that even if somebody isn't able to like ask for the healing themselves, um, that that you are able to sort of channel that on behalf of everyone. So I I want to recognize both that this is sort of the seed for that initial prayer, but also that we switched it because we can and should switch 
a lot of this stuff in ways that will better reflect the realities of our time. In line with being easily thrown by the double portion, I had actually, in preparation for this podcast, looked at the Haftorah associated with Bahar, which most congregations wouldn't read, that could go kind of part and parcel with this. As we're going to dive into when I talk about the weekly Torah portion, Bahar is so interesting because it talks about this idea of every seven years kind of taking a sabbatical from working the land and making property open to everyone. And then every 50 years having this incredible jubilee where wealth is basically um, in a, in a lot of senses equalized and a lot of things revert back. A lot of prop like slaves are freed and properties are reverted back to their original owners. It's fascinating. And in this part, in this Haftorah um, that's associated with that, the part that happens before the Haftorah reading is that Jeremiah is actually in jail. And he's in jail because he has said that the king of his prophecy that his king, the king of Judah, is going to be conquered by the by the king of Babylon, by the Babylonians. And so, of course, his king is like, well, screw you. I'm going to throw you in jail for that. And so as the thematic connection comes in, as Jeremiah is in jail, he has to... Um, like he has to redeem some land on behalf of his uncle in in preparation for, or not in preparation for this, but in in relation to what reading the Torah portion. And he's there. He he talks about doing that. He's sitting in jail, and um, as he and he as he's going on, I'm not sure we actually see this in the actual half Torah portion, but he does kind of start to worry knowing everything that's going to happen and but he but in this half tour portion he starts to kind of praise god and i'm not going to read the hebrew because we don't have five hours to, for me to get through a single line but but um you know he talks about what's going to happen and then his king is delivered to the babylonians and he says you know god all this stuff is going to happen it's so terrible and um, he kind of waits for a reply from God. And God says, behold, I am the Lord God of all flesh. Is anything too, is anything too wondrous for me? Um, and, you know, I, I think there, what interests me about this Haftorah in relation to what Lex just talked about is, is this really interesting kind of duality, right, of, of awaiting kind of imminent demise and imminent doom, um, not knowing what's going to happen while simultaneously making preparations for, for your future in a way, right? Preparing to have this land uh, redeemed on behalf of your family, even though everything might fall apart and everything might be conquered um, and, and wondering and worrying how those two things are going to reconcile. And what I think is interesting about where this, Half tour ends as well as where the where the first half tour that Lex talks about end ends is this idea of healing and faith and the power of God, which I think is in a lot of ways a concept that we as Jews are not necessarily super comfortable with, nor should we be, right? In the sense that Judaism is a religion that so values um, human potential and human growth and the idea that we are God's partners and the idea that, you know, our actions have consequences in the world. And so this sense of a miraculous God, a God who can do wonders, a God who can give healing, I think is in a lot of ways kind of outside the way that we normally care to engage with the concept of God at all, insofar as we engage with the concept of God, even in our daily Jewish, Jewish practice. So when we're asked to look at it, I think it's um, a really important way of coming back to awe and coming back to uh, and returning to the sense of something larger than ourselves and larger even than our own potential. Yeah, I think that's a really sort of beautiful thought and, and way to sort of try to grapple with this. I mean, I, you know, I maybe it's sort of the rationalist in me or something. I'd sort of take it also in a different direction, which is that I think it's so interesting to think about the historical Jeremiah when we're faced with some of these passages. Because, first of all, Jeremiah represents a form of Judaism 
that was basically like three Judaisms ago, right? Because because he was very much instrumental in the formation of the sort of pre-exilic Judaism, the Judaism of the late kingdoms of Judah and um, that, that happened after the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel and the refugees from the north come into Judah and they have to sort of come up with a religion that kind of synthesizes and a culture and a, and a peoplehood that synthesizes these two groups. And Jeremiah is kind of you know struggling with that in the waning days of it. He lived at the very end of the kingdom of Judah. And then, you know, after the kingdom of Judah is destroyed, there's sort of a new Judaism that's formed in exile and that's brought back and it sort of becomes the Second Temple Judaism. And that also changes pretty radically at the time of the Maccabees. Um, and then after that, you know, 500 years later, there's there's rabbinic Judaism starts. And that's more or less what we are part of today. And, and we're thinking about the next form of Judaism, right? the next Jewish future. But I but I think that with Jeremiah, it's it's particularly interesting because he's living in this period of intense, uh, intense sort of falling apart of the Judaism as he has experienced it, which hasn't been around for very long, you know, at the time that he's living. I mean, probably less than a hundred years, but but um, but still, that hundred years is a hundred years, and he's really struggling with this sort of collapse, and he's also struggling, I think, with with um, the sort of Judaites, the Jews, having been misled, right? That their kings starting with Josiah, who actually is really held up as this paragon by the by the priests. But he makes a terrible political miscalculation uh, in going to war, uh, in going to war against the, the Babylonians. And um, and then he's ultimately, for some mysterious reason, killed by the king of Egypt. And, you know, there's this disaster at the top going on. Right. And, and it, at that point, the whole kingdom kind of goes into collapse. And, and Jeremiah is kind of one of these guys who's trying to figure out where it's all going. And basically the prophetic dimension of him, not just the, you know, the sinning and the all of the God stuff, but just the sort of visionary as aspect of him is that he recognizes that. The, that that life as we know it is is not going to return to what it was. And, you know, ultimately, he kind of advises the people to once they go into exile in Babylonia to kind of settle in, build new lives there and accept that this is our new reality. And let's not allow ourselves to, to die off. Let's figure out how we're going to do this. Right. And, and then that speaks to me very much about in our times. Right. It's not what the what the person who put the Haftorah portion in there was trying to to get us to be thinking about. First of all, that was done 2000 years ago, you know, but second, so they wouldn't have known. But to me, actually, Jeremiah speaks very much to our times. And it it's not necessarily what he says, I, you know, I, um, not necessarily the, the idea that the people, right, the only way to stop the destruction and the exile is to repent and to serve God and everything. You know, that part doesn't speak to me. But the recognition that one way of being Jewish is ending and another way of Jewish being Jewish is, you know, has to come about somehow and that he's willing to speak that truth is very powerful. And and I think that, you know, the character of Jeremiah is one of these ones that I think that if modern Jews really got into and understood where he was situated historically and who he may have been in Jewish history, because some people talk about Jeremiah as having been one of the key authors of of the Bible, of the Torah, of many books, of, or at least of the book of Deuteronomy, or, or not the book of Deuteronomy, but the sort of school that followed after the book of De Deuteronomy, then and, and many of the other writings came out of that school, you know, and maybe not, but he was definitely a very key figure in this transitional moment. And if we think we are also living in a transitional moment, then potentially Jeremiah can become one of those historical characters that uh, particularly particularly speaks to our time in a way that, you know, some someone like that we've held up, you know, in the past, you know, from like a more stable time, like King David, you know, may not be as relevant. It's fascinating to look at Jeremiah, you know, in jail, writing or saying this stuff. I think we've got some great paradigms in contemporary life in the 20th century to look at people, you know, calling for justice from jail, like Martin Luther King. I simultaneously agree really strongly with Dan, what you identified with how Jeremiah could be symbolic of this huge transition period, but also like, it's hard for me to like make that practical with this. Like I, in saying all this stuff, I think it's been real, but I, I I've ignored two thirds of the words. Um, 
And maybe that's a good thing about Judaism is we find like one sentence or a few words that we like latch onto and make a whole thing out of. Um, we do that with Torah portions. We do that with everything. But like, it's a challenge. This question that we're exploring here is right that that this Haftorah comes every week and um, it doesn't speak to us and we have, find it problematic and you know I I sort of would raise the question like maybe we shouldn't be reading it anymore right maybe we should be reading a different book uh, every week right or maybe we should pick different chapters from the prophets that do speak to you know what and I think your question Jenna you know about sort of where did this even come from right is really important because if it came from you know God then you know maybe people would say you can't change it but there's pretty pretty clear indication that it didn't come from God um, and um, and it seems like it was it was so unimportant where it came from that nobody even remembers so you know maybe that's to say that really what's important is to read passages from our other books every week, not just from the Torah, and maybe we would be better off choosing passages that do speak to us, or maybe we'd be better off reading Abraham Joshua Heschel. You know, I mean, it's a tragic. It's tragic that modern Jews don't read Abraham Joshua Heschel, don't read Mordecai Kaplan. You know, because they're not part of the reading cycle. Well, that could be addressed. You know, I think that what, what's interesting to me when you read all the prophets is I, I think about how how many constant existential threats there were to Judaism throughout the time all of these things were being written. And I imagine that the vocabulary of these readings would have been very impressive to people at the time, talking about sieges and swords and famine and pestilence. And, you know, it, it certainly is interesting from a historical perspective to think, okay, well, that's where we came from and that's the stakes were always that high. But yes, in terms of making these things relevant for today, they don't, they certainly don't speak to, to our modern vocabulary and they don't necessarily address, we don't, we don't have these kinds of choices to make in our everyday lives anymore, right? Like we're not like, oh, who is going to lay siege to us today? Well, maybe North Korea, but you know, I mean, uh, on a serious note, like we aren't always being, we're, we're not in some citadel being attacked by this army and that army. So the moral questions of similar or equivalent weight would be perhaps those posed by someone um, like Mordecai Kaplan or Avram Joshua Heschel. Like what, you know, what are the choices that we make in our everyday lives? Um, you know, how do we incorporate Judaism into our political views and activism? How do we build um, Jewish, relation, Jewish relationships, whether they're with Jews or not? How do we invite non-Jews um, into our Jewish practice. Yeah, that that resonates deeply with me. And like, I think we get caught up in thinking Judaism is the content of the Jewish stuff that we're doing, and not like the practice underlying it. And I think that if we really recognize that there's something powerful and amazing about the ritual of connecting particular texts to the cycle of our year and repeating them on a regular basis, and that if we found the right text to do that in the optimal way, we'd be doing like an incredible service to humanity. Like then we'd be rocking and rolling. Whereas now we're just like defaulting into these ones because we inherited them. And I question whether that's how we would be best served. If we give ourselves permission to reevaluate our relationship with, um, with these Haftorah readings, does that then, does it logically follow that we should really be critically overhauling the Torah as well? Well, so Lex, uh, I don't know if Lex will agree, but I mean, uh, so I'll take a stab at it. But here's the, here's the difference between the Torah and the Haftarah as I see it. The Torah, we read the entire thing over the course of the year. So, so I, I think that it's different from the Torah, at least in principle, because I actually think it's a cool thing that we read the entire Torah in the synagogue over the course of the year, meaning nothing is being hidden. Nothing is being p picked and, and picked from, you know. And so uh, in terms of the other corpus, I guess like what I'm saying is that is that we're not reading enough, right, because we're not reading en we're not reading the right ancient material and we're not reading any of the modern material. And yet it's overwhelming. So somehow we need to have a new approach here. Yeah, I I don't. Uh, so you you weren't sure if I would agree or disagree with the distinction you made between the Torah and Haftarah. I'm pretty sure I agree. The main point I was trying to make before really just I think we need to look at what we inherit as I mean, to quote Mordechai Kaplan, like having a vote and not a veto. Like we don't have to like 
this this whole conversation began with us looking at the two half tours of this week and on some level being a little bit annoyed with ourselves that we didn't know which is the correct one like and that makes me sad because i'd love to look at these two at the bare minimum and say which do we like better which is more interesting which provokes us more or and and i'd actually like to make it far broader than this these two. i'd i'd like to open it all up to the entire corpus and say what are these great texts that really do speak to us and where can we put them and i agree dan that we and and getting to what jenna asked like i don't want to say like this one that used to be part of our cycle is like exiled like we still recognize that it was that it was once part of our cycle and if there is a time in the future where it really does resonate in a new way we still have it and i think it's important to have like a storehouse of jewish stuff where we can find a way that it resonates in the- and like for me i doubt if if we were looking at the whole corpus of text i personally doubt that this chapter 32 of jeremiah would be one of the top 54 pieces um i think there are 54 incredible pieces Min- there's hundreds that we could identify and that really would make people want to engage with this stuff regularly where they wouldn't be falling asleep in the pews. Like, and I, I just want us to figure out what those are. And even as Dan suggested, as I think both of us are getting at, like think about the, the things outside of any of the, the Tanakh, you know, the contemporary texts, the, like all the cycles we can think of that different kinds of Jews will connect to in different ways and make those available for people to have that rhythm of the year, but with different, with, with newer, interesting texts. So for my last question, lightning round here, if there were any Jewish text from any era that each of you would submit, and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to match it to a Torah for off the top of your head. You don't have to say what you'd be replacing, but yeah. any text that you think is so vital that it would be a great Haftorah addition or supplement or sub, I guess addition and supplement are the same thing, addition or substitute, what would it be? I think I've got one or like a genre of them. So, um, yeah, so there I learned in a class I took in college about this incredible genre of Jewish literature that I did not know exists, and they're called Tachinus. Um, they're these, they were written and they're important for a few reasons. One is they are almost entirely written by women. Um, and a few hundred years ago in Europe. So we had an entire like underground genre of liturgical text written by women that was not like the traditional, it was just women creating their ways of connecting to God. Um, and many of them are just incredibly beautiful. And I feel like we have this incredible burgeoning feminist world, um, but we haven't found, but our expectation is generally that we can't really find that much in our ancient or modern, like the period, like a few hundred years ago, Jewish stuff to back that up. We need to sort of create contemporary things, and we do, but I actually think if we were to take some of the incredible techenis, these Yiddish liturgical pieces written by women three to four hundred years ago or maybe two to four hundred years ago and match it say with the torah portion where we hear about the inheritance rights of women we hear about these daughters of zelophehad and i think if we could connect if we could do more than just say that's really cool we have this one precedent out of you know a hundred counter precedents that are patriarchal and sad in the Torah. Like we have like if we said you know here's that and we're going to identify a bunch of really wonderful other precedents in Jewish history for the empowerment of women, that would be cool. And I think Tachenis is a really good example of that. And you know there's there's others we could find too. But that's that's one thought. Dan, what are your thoughts? I think it's a great question, and uh, I, I love Lex's answer. Uh, mine, I feel like mine's more simple-minded, but I um, just can't get out of my head the idea that you know, what if every after every Torah portion we read the same half Torah every time, and it was the story from the Talmud of of the the potential uh, uh, convert or whatever coming to to talk to Hillel and Shammai and asking what the Torah you know could you teach me the Torah while I stand on one foot, and Hillel says to him. Uh, 
uh, what is hateful to you, don't do unto your neighbor. That's the entire Torah. The rest is commentary. And I and I and for me, it's like it would be so fascinating to be reminded of that after every time we read the Torah and to say, oh, and that force us to say, how does this portion essentially function as a commentary to this to what is hateful to you, don't do unto your neighbor? You know, and and just to focus us on you know the essence of Judaism and. Um, you know, it feels to me like like it would it would be one of those correctives, like I talked about earlier, that happens in law that 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 constantly sort of pulls you back from the sort of entropy, the drift towards conservatism, and just towards just sort of just sort of a lot of stuff accumulating that you have over a long tradition, and to just sort of remind you what it's all about every time. So whether it's that same half Torah every time, or at least something that has the function of uh, not actually mirroring the Torah portion directly, but reminding us what the um, point of the whole thing is. Uh, that's what I would be looking for. I would, something that was really illuminating for me, which is not even technically a Jewish text, was when I heard Abraham Joshua Heschel's daughter, um, who's a professor, Susanna Susan Heschel. Heschel, Susanna yeah. Heschel, yeah, speak about her father's work. And her, his incredible work um, in civil rights. Um, he was obviously a great friend and worked deeply alongside Dr. Martin Luther King. And the fact that he faced such deep opposition from within the Jewish community. There were many Jews who supported his work. So many. But there were also Jews who said, this isn't our fight. And this is not something that we need to be involved in. And, you know, we're just going to get ourselves in trouble and people don't like us already and we should just keep our heads down. And that was such an illuminating thing for me to think about because obviously, you know, history has, has proven that he was right and that, you know, that is something that all Jews are so proud of. You know, you mention Dr. King and everyone's like, Heschel, Heschel, you know, which is which is true <laughs> and we should be proud but we also have to understand that at the time, it wasn't inevitable. It wasn't necessarily clear to everyone that he was doing the right thing. And when I think about the concept of prophets and prophecy, this willingness to do the brave thing, the thing that's not easy, the thing that you know might, people might say, oh, why are you getting involved in this? I think that to me is a really powerful example of what it means to to be a prophet and to lead Jewishly. And I, I think that's gorgeous. I think that's right. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel is fascinating both on like the level of his written ideas and theologies and um, and also his political work. I think for sure. I I. I I love that you named that we just cry Heschel, Heschel, Heschel. Like that's exactly what happens in so many of our conversations about civil rights. And it's used as a way to sort of like get points for the Jewish collective for how we have stood up in the past. And often I find as a way to say, well, no, 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 we actually have been wonderful. And it's almost as if that means we don't have to do that much work now. And I, and I just really think that Heschel himself would be – would be incredibly upset and disappointed to be invoked in that way. Um, and I, I think that we, we would be served to think about like, what, what are we being called to do that, that parallels what he was being called to do? Yeah. Well, and I would just say about a prophet to, two other things. Like one is that, um, you know, when people think about the, the Hebrew prophets, I think they, they forget a couple of things. Number one, the prophecy was generally directed at ourselves, right? At our own leaders, at our own selves. And so, and I think that as, as great as Heschel, what Heschel did was uh, that we recognize him for the fact, another great thing that Heschel did and that other prophets do, right? In Heschel's case, by example, was to essentially point a finger of accusation at those who were not doing it, right? And And, and to say, you know, you Jews who are not protesting here, who are not part of this, you know, I'm also a prophet against you, right? And and I don't know that Heschel said that so directly. Heschel said it by example. I don't hear a lot of people saying it today, you know, right? Really, um, 
uh, really uh, sort of pointing a, a strong finger uh, at the Jews who are um, complicit with some of the violations of civil rights that are going oh. on in our society today. Oh, I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. I hear a lot of regular Jews saying it, but I'd like to hear some more prophets. Um, you know, and, and number two is, um, is that, um, is that I, I think that one of the things that Heschel did that was so important was that he wasn't only speaking, right? He, he, as he said, he was praying with his feet, but he was, he was acting. Well, I will just conclude that by, by putting pressure on something you said, um, which is you mentioned that in this age of the Internet and unlimited access to information, there's and I've talked about this on the podcast, too. There's this beautiful democratization of of Judaism, of holiness, which I also think uh, Vayi Kra is very much about, like how we conduct holiness in our everyday lives as opposed to just looking at examples of other people's stories. Who's to say I'm not a prophet? And I, I'm I'm being a little facetious, but I'm also being quite serious. You know, who's to say yeah. that anyone listening is not? Who's to say that there's any difference between a quote unquote regular Jew and you know, and someone who wears that mantle of prophet very consciously? You know, yeah, I think I, that's what, what's beautiful about modern Judaism is you know, yeah, I may you know, sure, I'm not sure which Haftorah portion is true on any given week, but that doesn't mean that I can't read with the text and engage them and encourage other people to as well. Yeah, I, I was, I actually, like, I feel like the same button that, like, like I, when, when Dan said that, I was, I was, like, intrigued and, and like, a little surprised um, because, yeah, and, I, and Dan, I don't think you meant, like, I think you, you I think all of us, are on the same page um, regarding the potential of of anybody, whatever level of Jew, whatever level of bad we are to to play that role. Um, yeah, I think that the important thing is to make sure that we do create structures so that those voices are are amplified as much as possible, and that um, and to be frank, that the that the people who have access to the levers of change in our community are listening to them. And, and honestly, I look at the prophets in the Tanakh and I'm not sure that always was the case. Like, I think they lost a lot of their battles and, um, but I think you're right. I think you're, you're speaking out, you are lowercase P and capital B prophetic through the work that you're doing. I hope we can strive for that too, because prophecy is not really an adjective used to describe like predicting the future. People think like a prophet is like, Oh, I can predict something that's going to happen in the future. No, prof, pro, the prophetic tradition of this of of Judaism is about like calling for structural, big ticket kinds of changes to society. And I think the Bad Jew Weekly, from its name on down, is doing that. And I hope we are too. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. Guys, this has been such a wonderful discussion. Dan Liebenson. Lex Rofus, uh, the hosts and minds of Judaism Unbound. It's a terrific podcast. You guys can check it out anywhere you get podcasts. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this incredible discussion. Well, thanks so much for having us. Yeah, it's been awesome. Two more things before we move on. First... I just want to flag the fact that our Jewish prophets were not the established leaders. In fact, as Dan pointed out, they're often the ones criticizing and indicting the leaders. Their prophetic gift was the courage to see things as they are and then name them. Judaism gives zero points for people who think things in their hearts and don't act on them, okay? No one cares what you almost or would have or thought about standing up for. No one cares about that think piece you wrote on Facebook that all your friends who already agreed with you liked. Words that have no transformative power are meaningless. But the flip side of that, I believe, is that anyone willing to put themselves on the line, to really do that, to speak truth to power in a way that is scary and threatening, to take actions that hold our Jewish people and the whole world to a higher moral standard, is a prophet. You talking to your family at the dinner table can be a prophet. You 
demanding that your synagogue or Jewish community take action to help right a moral wrong can be a prophet. And we desperately need prophets right now. And if the people who are supposed to be our prophets are failing us, then we have to find new ones. And once we have those new ones, we need as a people to listen to these prophets and actively heed them. If you recall in Shemot, the book of Exodus, we read about how the entire people Israel was given the opportunity to talk to God directly, one on one. But it was such an intense experience, everyone just delegated it to Moses instead. There was a thing there. But it was such an intense experience, everyone delegated it to Moses instead. But I still believe that every one of us has this ability whether you want to call it prayer or spirituality or conscience or intuition or just morality, we all know the right thing to do. And the more we practice heeding that voice, the easier it becomes and the stronger we become. Speaking of which, to quote a friend, if you voted for Trump because you thought he'd be good for Israel's security, congratulations. As you probably know, Trump has, among other things, unapologetically and seemingly on a whim, leaked Israeli intelligence to the Russians. And I don't even have to get into the Russians and the Jewish people. Have you seen Fiddler on the Roof? Because that's just pretty much what's going on. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, if you're wondering why this episode sounds so incredibly crystal clear, it's because I hired a sound editor. I want to be able to focus on giving you guys the best content and listening experience, and you also don't need to listen to me complain about how hard it is to edit sound week after week. So, in that vein, I have started a Patreon, which is a website where if you believe in this work and what I'm doing and what you're getting out of this, please consider donating. Something that I've started doing is donating just a dollar an episode to each podcast I listen to. I mean, if you think about it, a song costs even more than that. It's really hard to produce a podcast. And so if you want to do that for mine, amazing. Or you can even donate more. I promise it is not going to me. I will even give you extra content. Yas. If you, by any chance, want to make a bigger donation or any donation that could be tax deductible, email me at badjewweekly at gmail.com. And we, with Dan and Lex's generous help, We'll make that happen. Now, part three, Torah time. Let's do that theme music again. The song is so cool, right? It's awesome. I am so hashtag blessed and thankful that Jacob Yaffe let me use it for this podcast because it's super dope. But I'd be lying if I told you I did not hear it in my nightmares. Okay. (laughs) So part three, Torah time. This week, guess what? We are finishing up the book of Vayikra of Leviticus. Oh, you know you're going to miss it. No? Still thinking about Parshat and more? Okay, yeah, that continues to be, let's call it, a fascinating challenge. Well, to round things out on this book of the Torah, we have an epic double Torah portion, which, as Lex mentioned, is Behar Behukotai. Behar Behukotai, tongue twister. Behar, the first Torah portion we're going to read, means on the mount, because Moses is back up, still up on Mount Sinai, listening to God tell him what to do. And we're back into this game of telephone, with God telling Moses to tell the Israelites stuff. So we've talked a lot about Shabbat on this podcast, the full day from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday that we as Jews are commanded to take to rest and celebrate our week, mirroring the rest day that God took on the seventh day of creating the world. What we find out in Bihar is that when the Israelites finally arrive in what they knew as the Holy Land, which of course in our modern times is Israel, they are commanded to give the land, like the Holy Land itself, a Shabbat as well. So obviously no work is done on Saturdays because Jews aren't working then, so the land rests then too. But actually, every seventh year in this parsha, God commands that the land get a Shabbat year 
a whole year in which the land isn't worked at all and things just grow naturally as they would if there were no humans there at all. Now, this is smart on a purely utilitarian, agrarian level and is actually what farmers do even to this day, resting a plot of land every few years and or rotating crops to allow the soil to regenerate its nutrients. But there's another great component of this commandment, too, which is that all the produce that grows in these empty fields during this time is totally up for grabs. And I am talking about, like, whatever person walks by, whatever cattle or even just random wild animal wants to eat it, and so on. This works out, actually, I think, on a larger scale because you have to figure that when Israelites settled in the Holy Land... It took them a while to get everything set up, so it's not like they all planted their fields at the same time. So presumably, if it was your land sabbatical year, then you could buy crops from somebody else, and so on and so on. But wait, there's more. Every 50, 50 years of a farm's existence, starting on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement of that year, the land, or your whole estate, if you own land, uh, is given what the Torah calls a jubilee year. Not only can you not work the land, but basically everything reverts back to the way it was when the Israelites first settled in Israel. So if you have any slaves that work for you, you have to free them and reunite them with their families. If you've brought property from somebody else, then the land actually reverts back to the land's original owner. And then there are rules for how you can arrange to buy crops from other Jews until your fields are back at working capacity. There's all this stuff about, you know, if your brother goes into debt, then you have to redeem your brother, is, which is what we read about in the Hof Torah this week. And that was a kind of tenuous, con- oh, not tenuous, that was a connection between the Hof Torah and the Torah portion this week. So to me, actually, this is at the heart of why the book of Vayikra is secretly great. This Parsha sounds at face value super boring and irrelevant. I have no idea how to work a field. My family has not done that since Fiddler on the Roof times, and look how that turned out for us. I'm sorry, I just cannot stop talking about Fiddler on the Roof today. Klezmer music freaks me out. Okay, but look at on a serious note what this Parsha is talking about and asking us to do. And I'm going to skip ahead to chapter 25, verse 23, in which God says that the land, the Holy Land, shall not be sold permanently, for the land belongs to me, for you all are strangers and temporary residents with me. And this is such an amazing idea. I mean, this is such a great slap in the face of capitalism, right? In the sense that we live now in a society that is so built on acquisition and private ownership. And this Parsha is a complete indictment of all of that. This Parsha is saying you are the custodians of the earth, but the earth doesn't belong to you. Sure, you can work the land and build things and do things, but at the end of the day, you can't practice total attachment because all of this stuff, everything in our world ultimately belongs to God. The reverting land back to the original owner is a little bit of a red herring that I was confused about at first because it looks like it would be a way of conserving and consolidating wealth, but I think it's actually intended to be the opposite. You figure that after the Israelites have wandered in the desert for 40 years, which of course they're still doing at the time of this Parsha, they're going to come to the Holy Land pretty much like even keel, right? Like nobody has anything. So it stands to reason then that the original owners of the land would actually be far more equalized than even 50 years after that. So by making the land revert to the original owner, you're actually forcing a redistribution of wealth every few decades, which is utterly brilliant. Now, of course, this leads to a bigger question, which is, okay, well, this is a Torah, and the Torah is the central book that God gave to us, and if God was so smart and God wanted us to really live out these ideals, why would God not just say, you all have to be equal and share? Well, as we've seen, I think God does say that a lot. God talks a lot about protecting the stranger, loving the stranger, remembering your status as an outsider, But 
I want to harken back to something my mother said that I quoted, I think, in like episode 11. She loves Judaism and she chose to become Jewish because she said that Judaism is a religion that loves and respects human nature. And I think nowhere is that clearer than in this Parsha. Because this Parsha isn't just saying you have to strive for complete equality. The Parsha is showing us how to do that. But simultaneously, the Parsha understands that a completely equal society is not possible at all times, right? I mean, if you're trying to figure out a way for everyone to be completely equal, I mean, has communism ever worked? No. Why? Because it's impossible to make everyone inherently equal all the time. So what this Parsha is doing is showing us how to be realistic, but create a workable system in which everyone has a chance to live equally and which no one person collects and amasses too much wealth. So I think that is awesome. Then there's all this stuff about not charging people excessive interest and you can't charge your brother interest on a loan. And that's all great. I feel really good about that. Go Bihar. But then we get into Bahukotai. And Bahukotai in Hebrew means and my decrees. Whose decrees? God's decrees. Obviously, get it together. And Bahukotai goes straight into something that I find incredibly difficult. And I'm going to kind of pick, like, I'm going to kind of be a little selective here, but I'm reading from chapters 26, chapter 26, verses 3 through 8. And here's what that says. If you follow my statute and observe my commandments and perform them, I will give you rains in their time, the land will yield its produce, and the tree of the field will give forth its fruit. You will pursue your enemy. And it's talking about like all the great things. I'm just giving a few verses of like how much great stuff is going to happen if we all follow these statutes. Then we get to this, verse Seven, you will pursue your enemies and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will pursue a hundred and a hundred of you will pursue 10,000 and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. Okay, this is obviously hugely problematic. I'm reminded here of something that Professor Ben Rad said in my interview with him back in episode 12 which that it's tempting to dismiss fanatics of any religion as simply not adhering to that religion's truth. In Ben's opinion, as you may recall, it's crucial that progressive people of faith look hard at the parts of our text that inspire zealots. This is clearly one of those parts, this tribal, militaristic call and kind of carte blanche to conquer and vanquish and kill people because we deserve to be here and they don't deserve to be here. And when you look today at the Haredi, at the most hardline, hardcore Orthodox Jews who want to keep building settlements and encroaching further and further on Palestinian territory, and in some cases, even private Palestinian land, this is what they're looking at. I myself do not have a good answer for how we reconcile this. In a few weeks, I am having my absolutely brilliant rabbi, Sharon Browse, that I've I've talked about her so much. She's coming here on this podcast to discuss progressive Zionism. And we are going to, of course, talk about the very real conundrum of passages like this in the Torah. So I can't do this today, much less in five minutes, because this episode is so long already. But in the meantime, I want to flag it for all of us. But wait, there's more, um, because the Torah portion then goes on to say that it's going to get real bad for the Israelites if they don't heed God's commandments. And like the extent to which it is going to get bad is so much worse than what's going to happen to the people the Israelites get to vanquish. Um, so basically, God says, if you break my covenant... Then I too will do the same to you. I will order upon you shock, consumption, fever, and diseases that cause hopeless longing and depression. You will sow your seed in vain and your enemies will eat it. It gets super dark here. It talks about like you're going to be running, but no one's going to be chasing you. But parents are going to eat the flesh of their children. And Jews are going to be conquered and destroyed and scattered around the world. And, you know, the ship has clearly sailed on that. So (laughs) take that how you will. But then God says that if we're sorry, God will forgive us. 
And then we go on and we talk about tithing, which is great, but who cares? Um, how are we on earth supposed to reconcile the God of of Bahukotai, this very angry, vengeful God with the God of Behar, which we literally just read, who has such a compassionate understanding for human nature and kind of giving us a structure in which we are to work. You know, I think because of all the turmoil in America right now and in the world, I'm actually much more inclined to be receptive to something like this than I think I've ever really been before in my life. And that seems strange to say, but it makes me think of something that came up during the interview, this idea that there's such a huge corpus of Jewish literature and Jewish sacred text that there's really something for every season and and different things are going to resonate at different times. And, you know, I'm at this point right now where I think we do need to be scared. And I think that we do, scared straight, even, as it were. And I think that we really do need to stop being complacent and being so smug and passive in our moral superiority. And, you know, it's funny because as I've come upon passages like this, normally I would just be like, well, I don't know what to do with this. And now I'm like, you know, I, I kind of get it. Haven't we all transgressed? Shouldn't we be angry? Like, don't we deserve to have somebody angry with us if we're too stupid to correct our own behavior? So I guess that's just something to think about. But I think that also speaks to the kind of wonder and majesty of this concept of God in Judaism, the same God who gives us this beautiful template for how to live as equally as we possibly can on a financial level, who implores us over and over again, again, so much more than any other commandment in the Torah, to love the stranger and invite the stranger and, and never forget our status as outsiders. I think it's so incredible that God in the Torah is so many things. And I think that speaks to the fact that human experience is so many things. And, you know, just as when you're little, you need a parent who, you know, sometimes reprimands you and then sometimes is supportive of you and sometimes, you know, is your friend, but also sometimes is your authority figure. I think that is the latitude that we're being given here. And I actually find this weirdly, again, um, just... I guess, understanding and compassionate, weirdly, towards human experience and towards the breadth of human experience, not only over the course of history, but also even over the course of an individual life. So just as we are not one thing, God is not just one thing, and we need different things at different times. We have reached again the end of an entire book of the Torah, and I feel so deeply fortunate and blessed to be on this journey of learning and struggle and exploration with you. Be strong, be strong, and may we all have strength. That's the show for today. Thank you so much to Dan Liebenson and Lex Rofus of Judaism Unbound. Please check out their podcast. They do amazing work. And, you know, I think it's really important to be listening to a lot of different Jewish voices uh, because, you know, not everyone talks about their cats all the time. I say that like it's a bad thing. Uh, (laughs) And again, I am on Patreon. Please consider supporting me so I can consider giving you a great experience and extra content. Hey! As always, hit me up, badjewweekly at gmail.com. You can, support, you can support me on Patreon, or if you want a nonprofit status, uh, email me about that, and we will get it all set up. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom, and stay bad.